All right, so we talk a lot about religious history in this class. Uh, we talked about the birth of Judaism, the birth of Christianity. We've talked about uh, the ancient Egyptian polytheistic religion, as well as the Greek and Roman religions. Uh, we've talked a little bit about Buddhism in China and how they viewed their ancestors. And the reason why we focus so much on religious history in world history class is because religion has played such a vital role in history. It's uh, guided a lot of people's decision making and actions. Uh, it is one of the driving forces of history. So whether you're religious or not, it is important to recognize uh, the influence that religion has had on history. So today, uh, the, re the religion uh, that we're going to be talking about is Islam. We're going to be talking about the birth of Islam and also something called the Crusades. So the religious situation in the Middle East before the birth of Islam uh, was pretty varied. Um, there was a mixture of religions in the region. You had Christianity, uh, which was born in that region. You had Judaism, which was also born in that region. And you still had some tribal religions, kind of similar to ancient Mesopotamian religions, those type of polytheistic religions. So before the birth of Islam in the 600s AD, uh, that was the religious situation in the Middle East. Nowadays, it's almost entirely Muslim, except for the country of Israel, which is mostly Jewish. And we'll get into why that is uh, in just a minute. So who was Muhammad? Well, Muhammad was the founder of Islam, and he lived from 570 to 632. So in the year 610, uh, it's believed that the angel Gabriel appeared to Muhammad and told him to memorize and preach a new revelation from God uh, that would be used to, quote, restore God's people to once again worshiping the one true God, Allah. All right, so uh, Allah is the God of Islam. Uh, now, Muhammad is seen by Muslims as uh, Allah's final prophet and the greatest prophet of Allah. So they view Abraham and Moses and Jesus as well uh, to be former lesser prophets of Allah and Muhammad to be the, the final and the greatest prophet of Allah. And if you look there on the screen, uh, you have the crescent moon and the star. Um, that is one of the symbols of Islam. So with Christianity, you have the cross. Uh, with Judaism, you have the star of David, which you saw on the previous slide. And with Islam, you have a crescent moon with a star. Uh, if you look at a lot of, of flags of Middle Eastern countries such as Pakistan or Iran, uh, you see a lot of flags that have that symbol in it because it is the symbol of Islam. So Muhammad, uh, once he had this new message, he spread this message verbally. Uh, now his message was written down later on after his death in what became known as the Quran. So that's the holy book of Islam. You can spell it a couple ways, uh, but that's how I spell it right there on the screen. So the Quran is the holy book of Islam, and that was when Muhammad's teachings were written down. Uh, so this new religion pops up in the Middle East here called Islam, and it was accepted by some and rejected by others in the region, as you might expect. Okay, The region is already uh, very religious, has their own religions, Christianity, Judaism, other Mesopotamian religions, uh, and this new religion, Islam, is accepted by some and rejected by others. Now, the holiest city of Islam became Mecca. That's right here on the map, right here. You might uh, hear of the term Mecca as, uh, as the holy city of Islam. It still is today. So in the same way that Jerusalem might be seen as the holy city of both Judaism and of Christianity, Mecca is considered to be the holiest city of Islam. All right, so that's the city where Muhammad was born. That is in present-day Saudi Arabia. Now, the second holiest city of Islam is Medina. That's also right here in Saudi Arabia. And the third holiest city is actually Jerusalem, because that is where Muhammad is believed to have ascended into heaven. Uh, he was born in Mecca. He moved to Medina, and then he is believed to have ascended into heaven from Jerusalem. So all three of those cities are holy cities to Muslims. And the fact that Jerusalem is seen as a holy city for Muslims, Jews, and Christians will become very important later on when we talk about the Crusades. So a little bit about the religion of Islam. Uh, first of all, I mean, we talked about some of the basic tenets of Christianity and other things. Uh, just a few things about Islam before we talk about how it spread. Um, it's comprised of five things 
that every Muslim must do in order to go to heaven. Uh, and these are called the five pillars of Islam. You got to do these five things, and if you do, uh, then Allah will be happy with you and you will go to heaven. That is what uh, Muslims believe. Uh, so the first of the five pillars is prayer. Um, you got to pray facing Mecca five times a day. Uh, if you've ever heard of a prayer mat, uh, you can uh, you know get a prayer mat. A lot of Muslims have that, and they face it towards the city of Mecca uh, and kneel down and bow down and pray five times a day. And you might say, well, how will they? How do they know which direction Mecca is? Well, there are actually things called quibla compasses. You know how a compass works; it points to the north, but a quibla compass always points towards Mecca. So a lot of times. Wherever you are, if you are a Muslim, if it's time to pray, uh, you can pull out that uh, compass and pray facing Mecca. Uh, so that is supposed to be done five times a day by devout Muslims. Uh, the second pillar of Islam is pilgrimage. So a pilgrimage is basically a religious journey that you take, a trip that you take to some holy site during your life. Uh, so for Muslims, the, pr the pilgrimage that they must make in their life at some point in order to go to heaven is a trip to Mecca. Um, at least once in their life. Okay, here is uh, the holy site. You see, you know, hundreds, if not thousands, of Muslims here uh, in a circle bowing down to this holy site in Mecca. All right, that is seen as the holiest place on earth to Muslims. The third pillar uh, is alms. Okay, alms giving. An alm is like uh, giving money to the poor, kind of like charity. You're expected to give a lot of money to charity or give money to the poor if you are a devout Muslim. Also, uh, you're expected to fast during uh, holy seasons like Ramadan, which is a holy season of, is of Islam. That is the fourth pillar. And then the fifth pillar of Islam is faith. Uh, so just believing in the statement that there is no God but Allah and Muhammad is his prophet. Um, so these are the five pillars of Islam, uh, what Muslims believe you must do in order to go to heaven. So back to the history of Islam itself. How did it spread during Muhammad's lifetime? Well, the community of Islam became a nation with Muhammad as its leader. He was seen as the political and military leader of the community of Islam. It kind of became a theocracy because it was a government that was based on a religion. Uh, now, Muhammad was a good military general, uh, so he was able to spread the religion oftentimes by force. Now, by that I mean a lot of times uh, when the community of Islam would invade a city um, to conquer that city, uh, Muhammad and his followers would basically say, convert to Islam or we will kill you. Uh, so some called Islam the religion of the sword. And uh, that is one big reason why Islam spread so quickly is because Muhammad and, and others like him would simply kill anybody who they deemed an infidel which basically meant you did not uh, believe in Allah. You did not believe in the God of Islam. Uh, so some people called it the religion of the sword. Uh, now, some people still today call Islam the religion of the sword because of you know, small radical groups like ISIS and Al-Qaeda that, that do sort of the same thing, kill you if you're not a Muslim. Um, but that is uh, the way that Islam spread so quickly. Now, what happened to the community of Islam after Muhammad's death is it actually continued to grow. So you have this guy named Abu Bakr, who was Muhammad's father-in-law, and he was appointed the caliph, which means the leader uh, of the community of Islam. However, a lot of Muslims believed that Muhammad's son-in-law, Ali, was actually the rightful heir and should have been appointed the caliph after Muhammad's death instead of Abu Bakr. So there was this division within the community of Islam about who should be the actual leader now that Muhammad is dead. Should it be Abu Bakr, uh, Muhammad's father-in-law, who was older and more experienced, or should it be Muhammad's son-in-law, Ali, who is younger and less experienced but has more of a direct bloodline um, to Muhammad? Okay, so that was a big question, and this caused a split in the religion. So Abu Bakr's supporters became a certain type of Muslims called Sunni Muslims, and Ali's supporters became what we now know as Shiite Muslims or Shia Muslims. Uh, now, this division exists still to this day. About 80% of Muslims are Sunni Muslims, and about 20% are Shiite Muslims. All right? And if you look at this map here, the dark green, um, that is uh, Shiite Muslims, and the light green is Sunni Muslims. All right? 
Uh, now, a lot of times whenever I teach this, the first thing that people ask is, okay, so which one is the peaceful Muslims and which one is the Muslims that, that, that kill people? It, it's not that simple, though. Uh, it's not that simple at all. Um, there are radical Muslims that, that do commit terrorist attacks. It's a small percentage of the entire religion. Some of them are Sunni, some of them are Shiite, um, but the majority of individual Muslims are peaceful. So Abu Bakr contributed to the spread of Islam whenever he took control uh, by recording the Quran for future generations. Remember how I said that uh, Muhammad's teachings were spread verbally before his death? Well, Abu Bakr was the person who wrote them down, wrote it down in the Quran, and to this day, uh, Muslims read the Quran. In fact, devout Muslims will only read the Quran in its original language, in Arabic. Now, Abu Bakr also started a military campaign to spread the Islamic empire beyond the Arabian Peninsula. So this area in the dark brown, that was conquered during Muhammad's lifetime. And then after that, all of this area here in the orange and in the yellow, that was conquered over the hundred years or so after Muhammad died. And remember I said Islam spread mostly by force. Uh, usually people, uh, the Muslims who would invade these areas would say convert or be killed, and people would either convert or be killed. Uh, so by the end of the 700s, by the end of the 8th century, uh, Islam had spread to what we now know of today as the Islamic world. So North Africa and the Middle East, and also into Spain. Um, so this whole area that you see on the map, uh, the Middle East, North Africa, that is still the majority of the Muslim population in the world. So by the end of the 700s, that had firmly been established as Muslim territory. Now, one of the most famous Muslims uh, from the Middle Ages was a guy named Mansa Musa. Mansa Musa, pictured uh, right there on the top. Uh, now, he ruled the Kingdom of Mali in Africa during the 1300s. So this is several hundred years after Muhammad uh, by that time, Islam had been firmly entrenched in the area, and he ruled the kingdom of Mali right here on the African map, okay, kind of an empire at that time. And he traveled all across the known world. Not only was Mansa Musa incredibly rich, uh, very, very wealthy, but he also traveled all over the place. He traveled to Egypt, uh, obviously he traveled to Mecca. Every Muslim is expected to travel to Mecca at least once in their life. He also traveled to Constantinople, to Russia, to India, just traveled all over the known world. So this expedition of Mansa Musa's really connected Africa to much of the rest of the world. Sub-Saharan Africa, or the area below the Sahara Desert right here, before Mansa Musa was kind of cut off from the rest of the world. Just a bunch of different tribes that really didn't have connections to the rest of the world. The Silk Road did not go through that portion of the world. But through his travels, Mansa Musa was able to connect Africa to the rest of the world. So it was at this time that Africa became much more influential on the world stage. Now you might think, well, what did Christians think about uh, Muslims taking over their holy land, uh, taking over, you know, present-day Israel and the city of Jerusalem? It, just, it was just completely taken over by the Muslim world within a century. Well, Christians certainly did not like the fact that former Christian land had turned Muslim. Okay? They didn't like the fact that um, the place where you know, Jesus uh, was crucified and had his earthly ministry, uh, and uh, as far as their belief rose again, um, they didn't like the fact that that land had now been under Muslim control. However, there was no attempt by Christians to take it back from the Muslims by force because the Muslims that controlled the region still allowed Christians to make pilgrimages to their holy land. Uh, the Muslims who took over um, the Christian holy land, they knew how important pilgrimages were to them. Uh, so they said, all right, we're still going to allow Christians to make pilgrimages to Jerusalem and to the holy land. So because Christians were still allowed to visit the holy land, that is one big reason why Christians didn't have a huge problem with Muslims taking over their former territory. However, that all changed about 300 years later, and that is what led to the Crusades. Now, before we get into the actual events of the Crusades, there are some uh, vocab terms we need to go over. First, 
is the term holy land. Uh, so holy land is basically an area of the world that is important to you religiously. So for Christians, the area where Jesus lived and died and um, and rose again and you know his earthly ministry, that is the holy land for Christians, all right? You can still take pilgrimages there today. Here at the top is a map of a common pilgrimage that modern day Christians take. You fly into Tel Aviv, you get to go to Jerusalem, Bethlehem, where Jesus was born, all over this area where he traveled and had his earthly ministry and get to see the place where he was crucified and things like that. Um, so that is what the term holy land means. So the holy land for Christians is uh, modern day Jerusalem, okay, Israel, that, that whole area. The next term to know is pilgrimage. Uh, we've mentioned this a couple times so far, but it's basically a journey that one takes to a place of religious significance to them. Uh, so for example, Jerusalem for Christians, right? You can take a pilgrimage to Jerusalem if you're a Christian. Uh, Muslims take pilgrimages to Mecca, all right? So a lot of uh, different religions take pilgrimages to places on earth that have religious significance to them, and it's really important to a lot of people. Next term, holy war. Okay, a holy war is a war that is believed to be ordained or commanded by God in order to wage for his glory. Okay, so in other words, something that people believe that God wants them to do, they want them, uh, he wants them to wage this war in order to glorify him. Um, there's not really a concept of a holy war in Christianity, but there is in Islam, and that comes into play with the Crusades as well. So that's a term you need to know, holy war. And then finally, the last term we need to know here before we get into the Crusades is the papacy. The papacy, all right? So that is the leadership of the Roman Catholic Church, still to this day, as well as a thousand years ago. It's called the papacy. Uh, so that's led by the Pope. Uh, you also have cardinals and archbishop, pretty much anyone high up in the leadership in the Roman Catholic Church, in the Vatican. That is what we call the papacy. So, Christians living in medieval Europe often took part in these pilgrimages to the Holy Land, especially to Jerusalem. Uh, if you ever read a book called The Canterbury Tales, um, that is a book about um, a bunch of people taking a pilgrimage to a holy site. Now, that one was not Jerusalem, but still a lot of Christians did take pilgrimages to Jerusalem. That was something really big um, that they wanted to do in their life. Remember I said... Um, uh, last class, how uh, most medieval Europeans, especially peasants, never got to leave their village. Well, if they only got one chance to leave their village in their entire lives, guess where they were going to choose to go? They were going to choose to go to Jerusalem because that was their holy land. Uh, so in the 600s, as we said, Muslims took control of Jerusalem and the rest of the Christian holy land, Okay, this area that had previously been held by the Roman Empire then the Byzantine Empire and other Christians, it was now taken over by Muslims. Now, Christians did not like this and were not fond of the Muslims. They weren't allies or friends with them, but the Christians made no military attempt to recapture the Holy Land because the Muslims still allowed for them to make their pilgrimages to Jerusalem. Okay, so that's the one thing that the Muslims were very smart about. They said, okay, we're not going to forbid the Christians to make their pilgrimages, otherwise they might try to take this land from us. All right. So for about 300 years, there was relative peace and stability. Um, Christians did not try to take back the Holy Land. However, uh, in the 11th century, one thing changed uh, the entire attitude of Christians toward Muslim control of the Holy Land. And that is that in the 11th century, which is the 1000s, a different group of Muslims took over the Holy Land. Just like there are different groups of Christians, there are also different groups of Muslims. And this group was called the Seljuk Turks. The Seljuk Turks. Now, they took control of the Holy Land. They sacked all of the holy cities, including Jerusalem, destroyed a lot of the holy sites of, uh, of Christianity. And the big thing is they stopped allowing Christians to make their pilgrimages there. They said, nope, this is... Allah's territory, this is Muhammad's territory, this is not Jesus's territory, okay? So they stopped allowing Christians to make their pilgrimage there, which was a huge mistake, because at that point, that is when Christians started to say, okay, now we have a problem. 
now this is unacceptable. We were okay with Muslims having control of the Holy Land as long as we could still go there on pilgrimages, but now something needs to be done. We need to take back the Holy Land. That way we can keep making our pilgrimages. So in the year 1095, the current Pope at the time, Pope Urban II, he gave a call to arms for all good Christians to come to the aid of their people and take back Jerusalem from the Muslims. He said this was the right thing to do. This is what we needed to do in order to make our pilgrimages. So many Europeans wanted to defend Christ and protect his, his kingdom, so they answered the call. They said, absolutely, this is the right thing to do. It's not right that uh, the Muslims have taken over our land and won't allow us to make pilgrimages anymore, so we're going to answer this call and go and fight the Muslims and take back the Holy Land. Uh, so most crusaders were peasants. Uh, however, many of the leaders were knights. Okay, you might uh, think of the, the traditional knights and uh, this is what he would wear up in this picture right here. But most crusaders, people who went on the crusades, were peasants who wanted to do what they believed to be the right thing. Now, in addition to the goal of recapturing Jerusalem, there was another reason why Pope Urban II called for the crusade. And to understand that, you got to go back to what we learned about last class with the Great Schism. Remember, a schism had taken place, a huge separation in the church, had occurred 40 years earlier. That's when Eastern Orthodox split with Roman Catholicism. Uh, so since then, okay, for the past 40 years, there had been a lot of division within Europe and within Christendom. Uh, Christians had been very divided between Catholics uh, in Western Europe and Orthodox Christians in Eastern Europe, in the Byzantine Empire. Uh, so another reason why Pope Urban II called for this crusade was with the goal of uniting Europe and Christianity again. He said, with this crusade, not only will we be able to take back our holy land and start making pilgrimages again, but we will also unite all of Christianity again by giving them a common enemy. Okay, you know, how to unite people is to give them a common enemy. So he said, we'll make the Seljuk Turks, we'll make the Muslims our common enemy and unite all of Christianity again. So this crusade... Uh, it's debated whether or not it was meant to be a holy war or a pilgrimage. We learned both terms um, a few slides ago. Now, in Christianity, as I said, there really is no such thing as a holy war. Like, a war might be seen as just, but not holy. It might be seen as the right thing to do, um, but not seen as holy or ordained by God. Uh, so, for example, during World War II, a bunch of Christian nations said it's the right thing to do to join this war. This is a just war because we have to stop evil. Uh, but it's not seen as a holy war uh, because Christians don't believe that it was ordained by God to wage for his glory. All right, So that's not really something that Christians believe in, uh, but it is something that Muslims believe in. But since uh, the whole concept of a holy war is not really existent in Christianity, Pope Urban describes this crusade as primarily a mass pilgrimage to the Holy Land. That's how he sold it. He said, uh, this is not a war, this is not a holy war, this is a mass pilgrimage to the Holy Land. And if Muslims get in our way, well, then we're going to fight. Then there's going to be military action. So that's how he kind of got around the concept of holy war, since that's not a thing in Christianity. He said there's going to be a mass pilgrimage, and if the Muslims get in our way, which he knew they would, he said then... There would be military action, and we will take them down. So the events of the First Crusade, this lasted three years from 1096 to 1099. Now, the First Crusade was unbelievably successful for the Christians, uh, for the Crusaders. It was a huge success. Uh, they were able to recapture both Antioch and Jerusalem, all sorts of holy sites, holy cities, and they removed the Muslims from power there. Okay, They pretty much retook back the entire Holy Land, after which they made both cities Christian kingdoms, all right? So that area became a Christian kingdom again. Now, most Europeans interpreted this military success as a miracle. They said, how else could we have come into this, uh, this foreign land here and these people who are defending their own soil and just beat the snot out of them? Uh, it was such a huge success. 
Uh, so most Europeans said that must mean that God is on our side, and they interpreted this success as a miracle. Now, Christians maintained control of these holy cities for about 50 years and were able to keep out all potential Muslim invaders. So the First Crusade was very successful, and these Christian kingdoms remained intact for about 50 years. But then, about 50 years after the First Crusade, in the 1140s, a small portion of the Christian kingdoms uh, that had been founded during the First Crusade fell to Muslims again. Okay, they, they conquered part, not all, but part of the Christian kingdoms. So Jerusalem was still intact, still under Christian uh, control. It was still a Christian kingdom. But since part of the Christian kingdoms had now been taken over by Muslims again, this caused the current pope, at this, at, by this point it was Pope Eugene III, he said, okay, now it's time for a second crusade. Uh, since the first crusade was so successful, he said, now that our, um, our power and dominance in the region is being called into question again, it's time for a second crusade. So this lasted from 1147 to 1149. Now, this was a miserable failure for the crusaders. As successful as the first crusade was, that's how unsuccessful the second crusade was. Um, the Christians were decisively defeated and pushed back by the Seljuk Turks. And this actually left the Christian kingdoms much, much weaker, uh, which eventually led to the fall of Jerusalem about 40 years later. So the Muslims did win the Second Crusade, but by that point, for a while still, the Christians did hold some land in the Holy Land, including the city of Jerusalem itself. And then came a guy named Saladin. Okay, Saladin of the Ayyubid Empire. Now, he was a very impressive Muslim general. He was not a Seljuk Turk. He was an Ayyubid Muslim. And in the year 1187, since he realized that uh, the Christian kingdoms had been weakened by the Second Crusade, he and his army led a campaign to recapture the Holy Land from the Christian Crusaders. The entire thing, first Damascus, then Jerusalem, the, the holy city uh, for, for Christians and a holy city for Muslims. Okay, so this included the Battle of Hattin uh, and the Battle of Jerusalem. Okay, so with this, Christians lost control of the Holy Land. Now we're going to watch um, a couple videos here in class uh, once everybody's finished with their notes um, from the movie Kingdom of Heaven. Very good movie, very entertaining movie about this uh, battle here, this time between the Second and Third Crusades. Uh, when Muslims took back the Holy Land from the Christians and the fight that the Christians put up um, to keep Jerusalem. All right, uh, so we're going to watch that at this time, and next class we will pick up with the Third Crusade, which happened because Saladin and the Muslims took back the Holy Land. All right, so ask me if uh, you have any questions or if I can re-explain anything.